Today we're talking about the $70 million University City TIF. I'm David Stokes. Today on the public interest, we have we have invaluable local gadfly Tom Sullivan, who is dedicated to, to fighting the good fight for responsible government in many many ways. But he's here today to talk with us about the University City TIF proposal. Thank you for coming, Tom. Thanks for inviting me, Dave. Today we're going to be enjoying some white wine. Usually, as regular viewers know, we have a beer during the show, but. On this nice summer day, I thought we'd have some wine. And also, I thought we had beer in the fridge, and it turns out we didn't have any. So necessity is the mother of invention in this case, Tom. Uh, I think we can get by with the wine. I think we'll be fine, too. So coming up soon, there's been a lot of discussion in University City about the $70 million TIF proposal, basically at the corner of Olive and the 170, Olive and the Interbelt, on the eastern side of it, right? Correct me on any of this taking out a lot of current businesses, some of whom are probably happy to be bought out, some of whom don't want to be bought out at all. Uh, getting rid of that, putting in a new megaplex office park, industrial, whatever you want to call it, centered by a Costco, is the word we keep hearing, that there'll be a Costco there, and they want $70 million of taxpayer money to do it. Now some say it will revitalize that area. I look at successful businesses like Buyer's Lumber and Bob Seafood and others, and, uh, and see, I see plenty of economic vibrancy right there as it is. But nonetheless, the council seems supportive of the $70 million TIF, and you've been leading some of the opposition to it. What are some of the reasons you're so opposed to this, Tom? Well, the whole development is just absurd on its, on its face. Here you have a, the city council wanting to bulldoze 50 acres and the, it, right around the Isle of the 170 area. It would result in 70 homes. 58 apartment units, dozens of businesses, two churches, and one school, all being torn down to make way for a big box Costco. And I don't think that this is what people at University City want. This is not, this is not something that you would really think of as being part of UC City, just to replace all these diverse businesses, all these successful businesses, all these thriving businesses, and then just tear them all down and put in acres of parking and a, and a Costco. And I think the way that this has been done is perhaps really, really something that has people irritated is that no one was ever asked. This was all pretty much planned in secret. It first was announced around April of 2018, but then we're finding out they've actually been involved with this for a year beforehand. So nobody said to the citizens, is, is this what you want? Is this fall in line with what you think we should be doing in University City? It's just they got behind this and, they, and the city is just obsessed almost with the project for pushing it forward and they got to get 70 million dollars from the taxpayers so this whole thing not only is it a is it a, is it a bad development not only does it go against the values of, of university city but it was all almost done in secret so we're getting rid of 128 housing units does the development have any residential component or will it be bringing in any apartments or housing units of its own? Yes, it's, it, about 70 resi residences are going to be bulldozed and uh, that's in addition. But it will be, re will they be replaced by any residential developments as part of the new development? No, not, not, that, not that anybody knows for sure. They've talked about having luxury apartments, luxury condominiums, but that's another problem too is we don't know what the, what the development is. At this point, we don't even know for sure that Costco is, is, is uh, committed. I mean, obviously, the name has been thrown around, but part of, the, uh, part of the agreement with the developer was they can't tell anything, tell anybody about what's been going on. So if you're a citizen, you don't really know if you, should be for, if you want to be for it or you want to be against it. Uh, all we know for sure, or, or at least we think we know, is that a Costco is coming in. What else is coming with it? Uh, they've already had one smaller anchor pull out. Uh, there's talking about grocery stores, but we do not know anything as far as who is committed. The Costco may or may not be committed. We don't have, we haven't seen any letters of, of, of financing from any bank. And as far as the rest of the smaller units go, I mean, smaller stores don't, we don't know, abs don't know absolutely anything, don't know anything at all. So here you have the city council prepared to approve this development with $70 million taxpayer subsidy and nobody knows for sure what it's all about really, which have a general outline. So that $70 million would go for over 23 years, like a, a normal tip. Are there any other 
components to it besides the TIF? Is there a community improvement district or a transportation development uh, district? Oh, uh, those part might of the plan? those might come later on. And again, you're going to see you'll end up with uh, with uh, sales tax. 10%, 11%, 12%, all these things can be added, added later on. I think they are talking about a, a CID, Community Improvement Development Tax. But again, everything is in flux. There's no, nothing is real, you don't know for sure exactly what all is going to take place and that they're gonna approve it anyway. One of the reasons it's all in flux is because the, the planners hired by the city and the developer to prepare all the documents for this committed just a spectacular error in their, in their planning if you want to describe that for, for the people. Well, they came up with a, a citizen had to find this out, by the way. They, they, they were $27 million. Greg, Gregory Pace. Greg Pace. Who, who, I, who is a, a, a fine gentleman and very, Greg, very knowledgeable. Greg is a retired engineer and he is a really smart guy. And he's been looking into it and he found a $27 million error in the calculations. Mind you that the city manager had introduced uh, uh, a partner in a law firm who was supposed to be the one to oversee it. He said that this will ensure that there's no mistakes, that, that he's going to double check everything, and, and we're going to make sure we get everything done right. And the next thing you know, finding out there's a $27 million mistake. So you have the developer, you have the planner, you have the law firm, you have the city officials, and none of them caught a $27 million mistake. So now they're saying, oh, trust us, this is all <laughs> going to work out. Well, it's tough, uh, it's tough giving them any kind of credibility. Well, now the mistake for, the, for our, our viewers was that the developer, uh, not the developer, the planners, and like either forgot or were unaware that University City is in the pool sales tax system. So that all the sales tax money, I should say, not all of it, but the bulk of the 1% general sales tax doesn't ju isn't just kept by University City, it goes into a pool and then is split by population, by a formula dictated primarily by population. But in all their numbers, they assume that University City got to keep all the sales taxes generated. And this is widely known that University City yeah. is, in, is in the pool. How they would hire urban planners and get that wrong is, is, is mind boggling. Well, the that said, everybody can make mistakes. I've certainly made mistakes in, I've never made a $27 million mistake in my life. I've never had that much money to make a mistake about. Well, that is quite a mistake. I haven't seen anything uh, quite that big. And, and, and the thing which I find a little scary, too, is several years back, they had a development very similar to this in Sunset Hills, $185 million project. Uh, they were going to require buying homes, and they were going to put in commercial and all this. Well, uh, it was uh, just a fiasco because they had all these plans, they had all these homes on contract, and the developer ran out of money. Same developer that University City is using. It was the same planning company that University City is using and the same law firm that's supposed to check everything out and make sure everything's right. So it's scary when you look at the fact that they're going to bulldoze uh, 50 acres of churches, businesses, residences, and what's going to happen if they have a similar situation? If the developer says, oh, we're out, we're, we're out of, we just ran out of money. And that's exactly what happened recently at Crestwood uh, Plaza, the old Crestwood Plaza came in with these big grandiose plans and you're going to make millions of dollars of revenue every year, tore it all down and uh, the developer ran out of the money. Now why do, why do you think it has become so almost universally accepted that when big developments come into an area that they can go and request enormous taxpayer subsidies and they will get it because this is not how capitalism has always worked. You just 30 years ago if you'd have done this in the St. Louis region I think most Place would have laughed at you. They would have never heard of such a terrible idea. Yet now it's it's just assumed that you want to you want to build somewhere. You're just going to demand a subsidy. And wh why do so many local governments buy in on this? Well, the developer goes in to these uh, local governments, and most of these people on the council or whatever are not all that sophisticated in in, in real estate and in development. At University City, they don't have a single person on the real estate on the board that has any knowledge of real estate, but they give them all these huge projections, you know, millions of dollars every year. Uh, you just come in and follow our plan, and, and, and it's gonna it's gonna work for you. And then, oh, but we gotta have a we gotta have a big uh, subsidy. But don't worry, that's that's small compared to all the money you're gonna get. And and it's amazing how they will they will just uh, fall for it. And as I've said, there's. There's uh, two common denominators to failed projects. 
One is developers making these outlandish promises of revenue, and number two, uh, city officials who are foolish enough to believe them, and that's how they get in these binds. Well, I think it's, it's fair to point out, uh, I guess this is somewhat a defense of the city council, but not really, that the, the mayor and some other members of the city council are highly knowledgeable about finance. I mean, the, Mayor Crow is a very talented <laughs> financier and was very successful at, in, at, at, in previous careers in finance, and there are lawyers on the city council who I think are knowledgeable about this stuff. So I do think you're right. Sometimes, well, I know you're right. Sometimes very small cities with very part-time councils have councils who are just overwhelmed by the, the data of the developer and the information. But I, I, I do think that the University City Council is perfectly equipped to, to, to process this and understand it. Now, I, I don't get why they come out then and support it. I would think they would process it, understand it, and be adamantly opposed to it. They, they are uh, hell-bent on, on going ahead with the project, and they have not listened to any arguments. Terry Crow is uh, a guy who every time he runs for office, he tells you what a big-time businessman he is, and he's been very successful. But at the same time, look at all the mistakes they've had in University City already. You can go down to North and South and Olive, where the city bought land, bought property, tore it all down, had almost a million dollars invested in it, sold it to a developer for $100,000, took a huge loss in the, in the belief that they were going to put a mini brewery in there. That project fell through, so the city said, okay, we'd like to have our land back, and the developer says, sure, $975,000, we'll be glad to sell it to you. They didn't have the contract right, so now it's, it's, it's in, it's in uh, litigation, but you would think that that's something that simple, they, they would get right, but they have, but they have not. And, and this, again, Terry Crow was, 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 on, was on the council at the time. Look at the police station. They've got a big trailer park next to City Hall. It's costing millions of dollars. The city, the, the police station had mold growing in it and nobody took care of it. And nobody, I mean, it's right next to City Hall. So then they had to all move out and they didn't know where to go. So they have to put in a huge trailer park right next door to the, to the old police station. They're paying, uh, it's gonna cost millions of dollars. So I mean, everywhere you look, they have problems with, uh, with financing. They have problems with just accomplishing basic development. So the idea that they're going to have this $180 million, $190 million project, something the city, this is a size the city has never done before. This is something the size of that the developer has nothing before. There's very little to give you much, uh, much confidence that they're going to get this right. Now, is Nobu's being replaced by this development? No, Nobu's is still there. Uh, we, but will Nobu's be, be gone, the, the sushi place? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No. Okay, I know who you're talking. Not to use <laughs> Novus. The Novus is the developer, but Novus. I thought you said Novus. No, they they will be gone. Yes, all that whole area there. Because I will die on that hill if they get rid of if they're getting rid of Nobu Sushi. That is, that is a bridge too far. Well, that's just it. You have unique, you have unique restaurants there that are simply not replaceable, and you have restaurants there that are most likely are are going to go out of business. Some of them are owned by immigrant families, and you know they don't. You know, they found, they found places there that they worked very well with. It's just terrible that University City is going to do something like this. They have all these thriving businesses there. That some have been there, like Buyer's Lumber, they've been there for over 30 years. So the city is saying, thank you so much for having your business in our city, and thank you for paying all these taxes uh, all these years. And, and our gratitude, for our gratitude, we're going to now tell you to get out of town. We're going to bulldoze your building. So... It just seems horrible. I have a feeling if this was put to a vote in University City, it would be overwhelmingly defeated. Well, I would love to see it put to uh, some type of vote like that. Even, even if just a non-binding resolution to get the, the feel of the people, I would certainly vote against it. How long have you lived in University City, Tom? Uh, I grew up in University City years ago, and that was, I moved out of the city, but I've been back in here for oh, about 10 or 12 years. So uh, in a way, I'm sort of like a, a, a native. I am too. I grew up here for the majority of my childhood, and then my wife and I moved back in 2000, and she had lived here before then. After we got married, we settled back in her house and have been in New City since, since uh, late 2004 permanently. So we love it and don't, don't yeah. want to live anywhere else, but one of the things we love about The Loop and love about Olive Boulevard and so many other places is all the small independent businesses and not right. having some stereotypical suburban Hyper, hyper development. I mean, I hate yeah. the, I hate those places. Well, the idea that you're going to come into University City on Olive 
And, and instead of how it is now, you have uh, like the church there is architecturally significant. You have still have nice trees and shrubs and stuff. Now you're going to come in and you're going to be hit with uh, with a uh, acres of parking. And that's another thing too, as we find out with the loop trolley. When you look at the at the construction, the destruction, and then the construction, that's going to cause absolute chaos. You're going to have uh, asbestos dust flying everywhere, and they say, "Oh, we're going to do our best we can." Yeah, well, you know how that works out. It's just the whole idea is, is, is just is, is just horrible, I think. And, and I remember there was this title of, uh, of this one uh, article that was, that was very negative on the whole development. So th this project uh, exemplifies everything that's wrong with development, and, and, and that's exactly true. I will never understand why the, the, this developer thinks that $70 million of taxpayer, of taxpayer money in a non-blighted area. It's a perfectly nice area. And I will never buy that this is a, a blighted community. And it's just another abuse of that process. And I need to recommend, and I'll put the link up beneath the video, but probably 10 years from now, 10 years ago, excuse me, when I was at Chomi Institute, we actually shot a video for the part of Olivet on the northwest corner of Olive and 170, where they considered doing a big tax and criminal mm -hmm. financing package a long time ago, and it was actually one of the first TIFs defeated mm -hmm. in, this, in this region, one of the few TIFs that's been defeated in the region. And we shot a video several years after that TIF had been defeated that showed all the redevelopment and growth that had occurred in that area, mm -hmm. just naturally, yeah. without unnecessary incentives. And that's, I'll, we'll put a link to that video up, because it's, it's only a few, it's only a few blocks from this proposal. You have to realize 70 million, that's, that's almost 40% of the cost of the development. So when I say the developer, the, the developer really is, uh, is University City taxpayers. Even in the city, they say they try to limit TIF subsidies 10 or 15%. I don't know if they're succeeding, but they're trying. But to have a, something of this, enor of this magnitude and uh, to do it all without very little public input is just something that's it's, uh, I've never seen before. When is the final decision on it? Uh, the final vote's coming up, I think, on June 10th. There's no question it's going to be approved. But does it, doesn't it then have to go to the County TIF Commission, or is it already uh, going through Well, it, it already has been approved by the TIF Commission, and then people have said with the fact that it has, uh, the TIF has changed, it really should go back to the TIF Commission. Of course, the city says, oh, no, it doesn't have to. So I would not be surprised if there was some litigation in the, in, in the future. Don't forget the Institute for Justice has, in Washington, D.C., they have shown some interest in this also. If the TIF has changed, with any significance at all beyond just tiny changes, I would certainly agree it should go back to the County TIF Commission. And now we would, of course, have a different County TIF Commission as well with a new county executive. So I would like to see the new county executive and his representatives on the TIF Commission have a chance to, to weigh in on this. Uh, yeah, but they, they say that they don't need to. They, they just, any concerns that are expressed, they just, they just disregard them. We know what we're doing. Uh, we, we'll get it all done, don't you worry about it. And they're just, a, any type of uh, criticism, until, until the $27 million mistake, they just kept saying, oh, we, we, we've got it all under control, don't, don't bother us, we, we know what we're doing. And you're not, you, but you're not the only one opposing this. There are, there are plenty of citizens and citizen but, groups out op opposing this. Well, there are, uh, of course, the, the ones who, who are directly affected, they're, they're opposing it. Uh, there's residents who simply don't want to move in. And what's really sad is that, like I've, there's a lady that uh, I've been talking with, she's almost 70 years old. Uh, she's got her house, and these are nice homes, by the way. They're modest, but I mean, they're all brick, well-kept neighborhoods. Absolutely. And uh, she wants to be left alone. She doesn't, want to, she doesn't want to have to go through this whole process of you know, all these legalities of selling your house, and then you, all you go through the hassle of finding, where, where is she gonna find a home, even if they pay her, uh, you know, a, good amount beyond what it's actually value is, where are you going to go to? And then it's another big hassle. So uh, it's just a horrible thing, the way that they're treating the residents and the way they're treating their businesses. Well, I hope it goes back to the County TIF Commission, and I hope that the city strongly reconsiders this. And I appreciate all the work you're doing, and I appreciate you bringing this to the attention of our viewers. And thank you for joining us today on the public interest. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Tom.